Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Please welcome back Concordia's Director of Programming, Anna Dawson. Hi, thanks everyone. Hope you had a great lunch. Welcome back and I hope you're ready for a big afternoon of great programming. So I am pleased to invite the Honorable Keith Kroc, Chairman of the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue and 2022 Nobel Prize Peace, Nobel Peace Prize nominee and Natalie Liu, journalist at Voice of America, to the stage. Hello, Keith. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Keith, it's great to be nominated for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Were you surprised to be nominated? It, it was, Natalie, and uh, and totally humbling, you know, um, at the end of the day, it's always about the team. And I had uh, just a fantastic bipartisan uh, combination of private sector, as well as great uh, career officers at the State Department. Um, and, you know, it, it, it also got me thinking about what's, you know, what's going on with Ukraine and the horrible atrocities that are being committed. And when I think about that, I, I think about we need this uh, trust principle, this clean network alliance of democracies that I was nominated for more than ever. Um, and, and those are really the courageous people that really, really inspire me. Mm -hmm. How does uh, America's operating principles uh, work in terms of uh, promoting, building, constructing peace, both domestically and abroad? Well, I think, you know, the number one thing is, um, if you look at what these totalitarian regimes do, uh, we affectionately have called that the power principle, one of uh, coercion and bullying and, and concealment and co-option um, and deception. And, you know, if you look at uh, uh, things that we honor, things like integrity, accountability, respect for rule of law, respect for property of all kinds, respect for sovereignty of nations, respect for the environment, respect for human rights, these are the things that we honor and they don't. And if you think about it, Natalie, if I'm competing against you and I can steal your intellectual property, I can... Uh, I don't have to be transparent. I can use slave labor. I can use these coal-fired power plants. Uh, I don't have to obey the law I, or I am the law. I don't have to be reciprocal in my markets. I'm going to win every time. So with the trust principle doctrine did is it actually take these principles and in one jujitsu move, actually use it against them. And that was what we did, for example, for uh, to defeat the master plan uh, for the Chinese Communist Party's uh, 5G system. So in other words, we didn't exclude anybody. You just have to live by these principles. So it's very important to maintain uh, that moral high ground. And, and, and Natalie, uh, you know, I was asked in my Senate confirmation hearing by Senator Coons, what would be my strategy to combat China's aggression? And I said, you know, I would harness U.S.'s three biggest areas of competitive advantage by rallying and unifying our allies and our friends and leveraging the innovation 
and resource the private sector and amplify the moral high ground of democratic values. And, you know, when I look at that relationship between Xi and Putin, those principles apply. Mm -hmm. Talking about governing practices and principles, what's happening in Ukraine reminds people or makes people think more about the question of what governments do at home and the uh, correlation with what they may do abroad. So what are your thoughts concerning governing practices at home or domestic policies and practices in relation to government's uh, policies and practices abroad? If a totalitarian government oftentimes uh, um, is accused of human rights violations at home, are we more likely to see aggressive behaviors by these governments abroad? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, for example, what Putin's doing uh, in Ukraine, or you look at what she wants to do in China, they basically want to export a dictator out of the box. They're a real and urgent threat to democracies. And you know, if there's anything that I learned, Natalie, uh, serving in the government, that this democracy that we have is a 250 year experiment. And, you know, I grew up in uh, humble means in Ohio, you know, with a white picket fence, the dog average 2.5 uh, children. And you've got to fight every day for your freedom and for your democracy. And if it wasn't for the United States, there's so many countries that wouldn't have that freedom because the natural order of thing is the bad king, the dictator, the emperor. And Natalie, I know with your background, you experienced that firsthand in its base. Well, thank you. And um, when we think of uh, values building up a society, uh, do you see potential for this country, for um, America to heal, to uh, reconcile differences and to build a democracy even stronger going forward and become less of a uh, vulnerability in the eyes of uh, America's uh, competitors and adversaries alike. I, I really do, Natalie. You know, uh, I, I had a chance last week to uh, teach a few classes uh, to the men and women up at West Point, to the cadets, these transformational leaders of tomorrow. I also had a chance uh, to do that same thing up at the Naval Academy uh, up at Annapolis. And, the, and, and they give me more hope than ever in terms of, uh, of the future. And I th also think, you know, it's been interesting for me, Natalie, because I have 10 year old twins, as you know, boy, girl twins. And to watch what's going on in Ukraine through their eyes. And I think they understand, they, they're really learning that freedom is something worth fighting for when they look at these courageous Ukrainians. And I think they're also learning that in order to keep it, you have to put your life on the line. Mm -hmm. um, it may be fair to, is it fair to call you a self-made man? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I've been blessed with the uh, uh, all-American dream, you might say. I mean, I started off in uh, uh, my father's five person machine shop, which was five people in the good times and two people in the tough times. I was welded at age twelve, and uh, I've really been I've really been fortunate. That's why it meant so much to me to be able to serve our nation and give back to this great country that's given so much to me and my family. Um, and that's also why um, after my term in office was over, uh, I co-founded the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. Because if you think about it, our rivals, uh, they're playing the long game and they're playing for keeps in a game of four dimensional military, economic, diplomatic, and cultural chess. And the intersection point is technology, and that's the main uh, battleground. And so what we're doing at the Institute is we're 
taken some of those things that we developed, that model that we developed in terms of the trust principle <clears throat> and tech statecraft, which integrates Silicon Valley strategies with foreign policy tools based on that trust principle to advance freedom. So, uh, you know, it's, it's my life mission. I asked you the question about uh, self-made men, partly because um, in America, not inheriting parents' health, uh, no wealth, health, yes, for sure, but wealth. And even if our uh, parents or grandparents had a lot of money, we would want to know that we made something um, 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 out of our own lives, with our own lives, our own time uh, on, on this planet. And so that self, um, that individualism is a very strong strain, a very important strain in this society, as well as uh, community service and caring for each other. So if this country values people and the effort to not sit on inheritance, could we say in terms of uh, uh, political values, is it time for this country, for the American people to not take our inheritance, whether it's uh, people born in this country or people like myself who became naturalized citizens to not take the political inheritance of democracy for granted, but to work on it, for it in a more vigilant manner. By the way, Absolutely, without a doubt. You know, I think there's no entitlements when it comes to democracy. That's certainly uh, what I've learned and, and, and what I believe in. And, you know, there's no greater gift to give our next generations uh, than freedom. And, you know, that's, that's what we're fighting for. And that's something that we have to always cherish and never take for granted. And, you know, if, if we're going to, uh, you know, if you look at it, Natalie, there is nothing static about superpower advantage or our freedoms. It can vanish in an instant. And I also believe there's no substitute for American leadership. So every element of our national strength must be brought to bear on a task. Our ideals, our entrepreneurial drive, our industrial spirits our insistence on fair play, not just for ourselves, but for other nations as well. And the world wants America to lead because we remain a beacon of light and hope for the world. Talking about uh, other nations, the war in Ukraine has highlighted the importance of uh, alliance. I know in your work as Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs and Tech Diplomacy, you worked a lot on building, strengthening alliances among democracies, not just uh, democracies or democratic nations in the West, but democracies worldwide, not because uh, they are democracy, just because they're um, European or American, but they're Asian democracies as, as, as well. And uh, explain to us or tell us some more about the importance of um, trading more or a democratic alliance building each other up in a fast changing global environment, whether it's technology exchange or trading more with each other. Some would say buy more products from fellow democracies give jobs to our allies and partnered countries. Yeah. So share some thoughts there. Yes, because if you think of the, those, those principles of democracy that I talked about that we honor and authoritarian regimes do not, they actually use those against us for their strategic advantage. And, you know, it, it, we all believe in free markets, but when somebody comes in a market and doesn't play by the rules, the market is no longer free. It's a fool's market. That's why you've got to do something about it. And if you think of these totalitarian regimes, particularly the totalitarian twins like uh, Putin and Xi, 
um, you know, these guys believe in bullying and, 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 you know, yeah. One of the things that was interesting, my 10 year old twins came running up to my office when uh, this Ukraine invasion happened because they saw it on TV. And I said, dad, dad, you got to go on TV. I go, well, what, you know, why do I have to go on TV? And they said, well, you got to go tell everybody people are dying. We got to go help them. And I go, well, how we do that? He said, well, dad, that's the clean, uh, clean network alliance of democracies because even they know that uh, from the playground that when you have a bully, you can confront that bully and you can win if you have your trusted friends by your side. And so, you know, if you look at what China and Russia's strategy is, it's to rewrite history, pick off the weak gazelle from the herd and go after them. And when you have a clean network of alliances, like what we did to defeat 5G, you have 60 countries, two thirds of the world's global G- uh, GDP, hundreds of companies, then you have strength in numbers and you have power in unity and solidarity. And that's the key because America can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about strength in, in numbers, America is a country that has different political parties uh, America prides itself on a multi-party system, on competitive politics. And yet, some of the, this democratic feature sometimes is viewed as a um, uh, inconvenience, quote unquote, in the sense that successive administrations don't carry out uh, the previous administration's policies, making things a bit ineffective. In contrast with authoritarian or totalitarian regimes, continuous policy. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on that? And I understand that you, even though you worked for the last administration, you are quite um, in, you're very much in conversation with officials um, working in the areas like of econ and trade and the geopolitical areas uh, you worked on. Can you tell us something about that? Absolutely. You know. Uh... One of the things I, I think that uh, I'm really proud about our team is all the initiatives that we put together are carried on by the Biden administration. So these things that we put in place, like the Clean Network Alliance of Democracies, the Blue Blue Dot Network, which is an equitable and unifying alternative uh, to the One Belt, One Road, our work uh, in strengthening ties with Taiwan, all those th- things have now represented a bridge from a Republican administration to a Democratic administration. Uh, A few weeks ago, I I was with Secretary Gina Raimondo in terms of passing the U.S. Innovation and Competitive Act, which was a bill that we designed for research funding for critical technology sectors and then also for onshoring semiconductors. And then just yesterday, I was with, with Kurt Campbell, who's really... Uh, President Biden's Asian czar. And, you know, uh, what he said to me, he said, Keith, you were the first guy who called me up and, you know, told me the challenges that I would face. And, and, you know, it's very rare in government that that next administration will carry those policies forward. He goes, we've carried literally almost all of your uh, policies going forward. And I think that unity and that continuity of policy is so important for our allies. And there's nothing that scares the heck out of the totalitarian twins than a united United States. Thank you, Keith. We only have a little more than a minute left. And I wanted uh, you to share some thoughts on entrepreneurs and um, companies, uh, multinational companies' role in enhancing or safeguarding democratic values, both at home and abroad. Your thoughts? Yeah, you know, one of the things I did when I was undersecretary is uh, I went back home to Silicon Valley. I hosted 36 to the top uh, global CEOs. You've heard of all their names. And, you know, my message to them was, you know, out here in Silicon Valley, we say corporate responsibility is social responsibility, but it's also national security and global economic security too, because uh, 
these totalitarian regimes not only represent a real and urgent threat to democracy, but they re represent a real and urgent threat to your businesses because they don't want to just compete. They want to put you out of business and they want to do it by not playing by the rules. And so uh, leveraging the innovation, the resources of the private sector, this, and, and I could see it in the government, this is such a huge opportunity for the United States and the rest of the free world that is literally untapped. And we really need to rally uh, these industrial companies. We need to rally the tech titans uh, because that's such a great, great strength that we have. Well, thank you very much, Keith. Glad we could um, share these thoughts and with uh, the uh, audiences here today. Great. Well, thanks so much for Natalie and all my best to the folks at Concordia and a continued great conference.